Hello class, welcome to the next segment in lecture 15 and in this segment we're going to cover some topics related to vorticity including the introduction of some new types of vorticity that we can deal with in the atmosphere but before I get into that I do want to briefly talk about something else which is uh, some of the physical mechanisms that we typically find in the atmosphere that can lead to the intensification of cyclones or even to some extent anti-cyclones. But some of the physical is just going to, I'm just going to go ahead and quickly talk about these so uh, first of which is the presence of a strong temperature gradient. So again, if you remember back to the lecture on global circulation pattern, the atmosphere doesn't like temperature gradients. It wants to resolve those. It wants to resolve those imbalances. So it would make sense that if you've got a strong temperature gradient, then the atmosphere is going to try and it's going to uh, prompt a stronger response from the atmosphere to resolve a stronger imbalance. So if you've got a strong imbalance, you're going to you're going to get a stronger response from the atmosphere and that's usually in the form of a stronger cyclone or just a stronger wind field in general which usually is going to be around a cyclone. And another mechanism is zonal flow over mountains which is going to be something we talk about during the course of this lecture and that's related to the concept of potential vorticity but it turns out if you've got a strong zonal flow pattern it's usually a west to east pattern a flow pattern going over mountains, if you've got a strong westerly flow over some elevated terrain, then you can actually create a cyclone on the east side, on the lee side of the mountains, and a high pressure system or an anti-cyclone on the other side of the mountain range. And we'll talk about the physical mechanism and explore in depth what the physical mechanism that actually causes that. But this other one I want to talk about because it's actually uh, also really important, and that is the concept of latent heat release. So Again, this kind of goes back to the hypsometric equation where if you've got uh, a warm layer of air, then the spacing between your isobars is going to be much greater. And it turns out if you have a bunch of latent heat release in the middle troposphere, so let's say you've got a lot of thunderstorms that are going up, a lot of condensation, so you're getting a lot of latent heat release in the middle part of the atmosphere, you're going to expand that column. And in the process of expanding those isobars will bring lower isobars down to the surface, which can lead to some fairly rapid pressure drops at ground level. In fact, uh, between the three mechanisms shown up on the screen here, latent heat release is by far the most intense mechanism. It is responsible for the most rapid strengthening in, uh, of cyclones, and this is evident in hurricanes. Hurricanes don't form due to mountains. They don't form from any sort of temperature gradient. Hurricanes form almost exclusively from latent heat release, and by far hurricanes are the most intense cyclones, synoptic scale systems that we can work with in the atmosphere. And those are j almost purely governed by the mechanism of latent heat release, and uh, we'll discuss that in a little bit more detail later on in the class. But for this particular lecture, I want to focus on this idea of zonal flow over the mountains resulting in some sort of pressure drop and also some sort of pressure rise. So, so we'll focus on that, but in order to understand that, we first have to uh, revisit some concepts related to vorticity. So there are a couple of types of vorticity that we've already looked at, but we haven't directly named them, so let's actually go over those. So this idea of relative vorticity, which is something we've already looked at, it's basically just uh, zeta. It's just the uh, it's just basically the vorticity just due to the local flow pattern. And you'll you may remember, of course, well you should remember this: the fact that the Earth is spinning. The Earth, the the process of the Earth spinning also generates its own form of vorticity, and that's usually in the form of the Coriolis deflection or the Coriolis force. Relative vorticity just looks at the contribution only due to the wind pattern itself. So if you imagine, uh, let's say, a, for fun, let's imagine a tornado, you've got a bunch of rotating air, and you've also got a contribution from Earth's rotation, but that contribution is pretty much insignificant. The, the uh, vorticity of a tornado is dominated by the local flow pattern. It's dominated by the flow pattern of the tornado itself, as opposed to the vorticity caused by the Earth's rotation. So that's what we mean by relative vorticity. Relative vorticity is just due to the local wind pattern itself, and not to, and uh, we just we uh, we sort of just disregard the planetary vorticity. And another thing that is kind of important to bring up is this is a quantity that's not conserved, and you'll see why I choose to bring this point up when we introduce potential vorticity. But I kind of already mentioned this as well when I was talking about planetary vorticity, and that is in fact the contribution of Earth's rotation to uh, circulations or rotation in the atmosphere. And that is just simply represented by the Coriolis parameter. If you're at a higher latitude, then you're going to have stronger 
vorticity due to the Earth's rotation, and if you're at a lower latitude, you're going to have weaker vorticity from the Earth's rotation. And this also is not a conserved quantity. And then another type of vorticity that we can work with is absolute vorticity, which is basically just the combined total of relative and planetary vorticity, and that's usually represented by this Greek letter eta. And this also is not an, a conserved quantity, so absolute vorticity is just adding these two quantities together. Now we're going to go ahead and introduce the idea of potential vorticity in which we take the absolute vorticity and basically apply a bit of a normalization process. There is a very long derivation that goes into this equation right here, but we're not going to worry about that. I'll just explain physically what this represents. So this quantity called potential vorticity, which is sort of an abstract, funny way of thinking, uh, on the left-hand side is equal to the total vorticity times this d theta dp, which is essentially uh, a stability term. So, And you'll talk more about this specific stability term in some of your later meteorology classes. But there's also another way you can rewrite this equation. You can also write it as the total vorticity divided by the depth of the column in question, delta z. And these two forms are essentially the same thing. They both Rep, they, they basically represent the same physical process, the same physical mechanism, is just they're uh, just a uh, slightly different nomenclature, slightly different convention. In fact, there are quite a few different formulations for potential vorticity, but the two simplest ones are the ones shown up on the screen here. This total vorticity times d theta, which is theta is potential temperature, dp, which is pressure, and then also eta, the absolute vorticity divided by the depth of the column and uh, the depth of the column in question. Now the special thing, the reason why potential vorticity is even used in the first place is the fact that it is a conserved quantity in the atmosphere. And sometimes you'll also hear this referred to as barotropic potential vorticity, which uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's really, uh, barotropic is kind of, barotropic processes are kind of involved here, but not really. This is, uh, well, I should say this is conserved quantity for specific situations. So if you've got latent heat release, that's going to cause some uh, uh, cause some issues if you try to use this. But uh, if you don't have any sort of external forcings or any sort of external mechanisms that might influence zeta f or delta z, then this is in fact a conserved quantity. And the best part about this equation is the units of it. And I was being slightly sarcastic when I was saying that. The units for potential vorticity are the imaginatively named potential vorticity units, which you can show is equal to Kelvin's meter squared per kilogram per second, which is a, kind of a awful unit to work with, which is why we just call that whole mess just a potential vorticity unit. And if we invoke this conservation quantity, that means that the uh, potential vorticity at some previous point in time must be equal to the potential vorticity at some later point in time. So if the previous, so if potential vorticity at time, if we have a potential vorticity at say some time one, then that must be equal to the potential vorticity at some later time two. And if we invoke that conservation principle, then we get that the relative vorticity at time one plus the planetary vorticity, that's just a Coriolis parameter at time one, divided by the column depth at time one, must be equal to the relative vorticity at time two, plus the planetary vorticity at time two, again just a Coriolis parameter, divided by the depth of the column at time two. And this actually is kind of a powerful uh, tool to help, exp and it also will help explain a process of what we call least cyclogenesis, which is a process of uh, cyclones forming on the eastern side of uh, the eastern side of mountains as westerly flow goes over the mountains, but we'll talk about that in greater depth in the later in uh, in the next segment. But that's going to do it for the second segment, and as I just said, in the final segment we are going to just take a closer look at the idea of potential vorticity, the conservation law behind it, and what sort of role that plays in the atmosphere. So with that, I will see you all in the next segment.